Hello, and welcome back to another episode recap where I'll lay out five things that I learned from my conversation with a historical expert. Today, we're recapping the conversation that I had with Marty Morgan about the historical accuracy of Saving Private Ryan. Marty is a historian who has helped consult filmmakers and game developers and is the author of the book D-Day, A Photographic History of the Normandy Invasion. Now, if you haven't had the time to listen to my full interview with Marty yet, well, that's why I'm here today in this video to recap five things I learned about the historical accuracy of the movie Saving Private Ryan with Marty Morgan. So let's get started. Number one, the real people. Hopefully this doesn't come as a shock to you, but the Ryan family we see in the movie, they're not real. But they are based on two very real families that suffered great losses during World War II. Marty explained that one of them, the Sullivans, were mentioned in the movie. There were five Sullivan brothers who perished on the same ship when it was sunk. But the story the fictional Ryans are based on more are the Nyland brothers. There were four Nyland brothers who served during World War II. Marty told me that one of the brothers, Edward Nyland, was shot down in May of 1944. Then two of the Nyland brothers were killed during the D-Day operations. Bob Nyland was killed in action on June 6th and Preston Nyland was killed in action on June 7th. So because of the timing, that meant the Nyland's mother would get three telegrams all at once about Bob and Preston being killed in action and Edward being missing, which unfortunately often meant they were presumed dead. That left one brother, Fritz. He fought during the Normandy invasion as well, but soon after D-Day and following the deaths of his brothers, he was shipped back to England and then to the United States. So if there was a real James Ryan like we see in the movie, it would be Fritz Nyland. Oh, and as it turns out, Edward wasn't killed after all. He was captured and held in a Japanese POW camp in Burma until that camp was liberated in May of 1945. So two of the four Nyland brothers died during World War II. Number two, the battle on Omaha Beach. When we're watching the movie, it'd be very easy to assume those first 20 minutes of pure action and bloodshed are a depiction of how the entire invasion of Normandy must have gone on June 6th, 1944. While Marty did say the depiction was one of the most accurate that he's seen in a movie yet, that doesn't mean it's entirely accurate. For example, Marty pointed out that there were no flamethrowers used on Omaha Beach like we see in the movie. But one of the biggest things that surprised me about the way the movie depicts things versus what really happened was just how vastly different the battles were across the different beaches and the different locations. The part of Omaha Beach that the movie shows is called Dog Green Sector, and that was involved in the fiercest fighting on the beaches of Normandy. In other areas, though, Marty pointed out that some of the Allied soldiers just a few hundred meters from Dog Green Sector that's depicted in the movie received very little resistance. So it's not like the entire D-Day invasion was the same experience for everyone. Number three, an impossible shot. There's a scene in the movie where we see Barry Pepper's version of Private Jackson use his sniper rifle to shoot through the scope of an enemy German sniper. It's one in a million shot that I was almost completely certain was made up for the movie. So I had to ask Marty about it, and he told me that's not necessarily the case. He said that shot in the movie was based on a sniper named Carlos Hancock, who claimed to have done the exact same thing, shot an enemy sniper through the scope. The biggest change here would be that Carlos Hancock was a decorated sniper during the Vietnam War, so not at all during World War II. And Marty pointed out that the TV show Mythbusters tested if a shot like that would be physically possible, and they determined that it wasn't. The bullet wouldn't travel all the way through the scope, hitting the glass on one end and travel all the way through hitting the glass on the other end with all that glass inside. But Carlos explained how it happened in his book, and since you and I weren't there, I guess we'll just have to take his word for it. Number four, the 603rd Quartermaster Graves Registration Company. This isn't mentioned outright in the movie, but there is a nod to it in that scene where we see the group looking for Private Ryan as they're looking through a bag of dog tags. And this wasn't something that I ever really thought about before, but Marty told me about the men who were in charge of the remains of the deceased soldiers on the battlefield. 
they were tasked with identifying the body so they could have a proper burial, something that wasn't always easy to do with the destructive power of weapons during World War II. Marty praised the men in the graves registration companies and the mortuary services for their stellar work. As he told me, he's been studying this for about two decades now and has found very few mistakes. That's very impressive considering all their tracking and identification was done manually without the use of computers or any sort of digital assistance like we have today. Number five, Ramel. At the end of the movie, once they find Private Ryan and the other paratroopers, they're holed up in a town called Ramel along the Merderay River, or as they say in the movie, the Merderette. It's here that, according to the movie, the Americans try to hold off the advancing Germans to stop them from taking a bridge. While the Merderay River is real, the town of Ramel is not. So that battle never happened. In fact, Marty pointed out that the American parachute infantry forces didn't encounter any German tanks until late July. Well, that's not entirely accurate. I should say, any German-made tanks. Normandy is in France, after all, and the Germans had captured French tanks. Now, the tank that we see in the movie is a German Tiger tank, or at least it's supposed to be. Marty told me that the tank they actually used in the movie was technically a Soviet tank that they altered to look a little more like a German Tiger tank, but I think you get the idea. So, I should say, a better way to say that would be the American Parachute Infantry Forces did not encounter any German-made tanks until late July. That's all for today, and hopefully you enjoyed this episode recap of five things that I learned from Marty Morgan about the historical accuracy of the movie Saving Private Ryan. My chat with Marty was over two hours long, so we covered a ton of content, and Marty went into some great detail about the historical accuracy of things that we saw in the movie Saving Private Ryan. You can listen to that whole interview for free right now over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash 159. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash 159. And for more historical stories from the beaches of Normandy and photos to go along with it, don't forget to pick up a copy of Marty's book called D Day A Photographic History of the Normandy Invasion. In the meantime, for more recaps and full length episodes of Based on a True Story, hit that subscribe button right now. Thanks for watching.